First and foremost, um, who are we? It's Rufus Ballister here, along with Hattie Irons, Anna Storey, and Seamus Smythe, three of my colleagues, all of whom uh, are involved in commercial litigation at the moment. Um, Cardinal and Cameron, firm of lawyers in London, if you're catching up with us and didn't know us for some reason, it should go out on YouTube in due course, so we'll be a viral sensation. A um, few words about how CLC is working at the moment. So we are used to having one office. Uh, we currently have 30-something offices, by which I mean that virtually the whole cohort uh, of our family staff are working from home in their various locations. Uh, we have one, occasionally two, key workers who are going into the office um, and who are valiantly scanning everybody's post and dealing with original documents which come in. We are still getting original documents coming in. We are still doing transactions where we actually have to physically date something and get it in the post, um, etc. So life is happening. What about today? What are we going to deal with? We're not going to deal with employment. We've had two webinars on employment already. Um, it's been a very fast moving topic and we don't want to fill the hole with um, that stuff. Um, it's good stuff, it's detailed stuff, but it's quite specialist. We're not really going to look at land, land registry, landlord and tenancy, etc. We've had another webinar on that. Um, what we're trying to do today is to talk about commercial business contracts, including international contracts. And we're looking at the impact on the UK legal system, the English legal system specifically, uh, that COVID-19 has had. With that in mind, I'm going to hand you straight over to Seamus, uh, who will talk us through the first slide. Well, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> or good morning if you're a long way to the west of us, or good evening if you're a long way to the east of us, as I suspect some of you are. Um, I'm, I'm new to these webinars, as I think Hattie and Hannah are as well. So I ask you, in a sense, to cut us a little bit of slack if it's not quite as slick as we would like it. Uh, we would welcome um, uh, questions, of course, during during the webinar, and also in, in due course, if you have any suggestions to make about how these webinars could be improved, we'd welcome those too. Now, I'm dressed in a jacket and tie, which you might be able to see, and I haven't worn a jacket and tie for about two months now. But I'm acutely conscious that um, one has to be um, well turned out for these things. I even polished my shoes this morning until somebody told me that that wasn't strictly necessary. But if I'm challenged on that, I can prove it. But I am aware that about a month ago, a judge in Florida who was conducting a, um, a hearing by video became um, uh, quite cross with the attorneys who were appearing before him, appearing being the... Uh, the accurate word because one of them was by the side of the pool and dressed in whatever kit you'd expect someone to be wearing when by, by the side of the pool and the other one according to the press report was still in bed so just in case that Florida judge is one of the attendees today I thought I'd better dress up right uh, as Rufus mentioned the emphasis today is on business and commercial contracts business to business contracts rather than employment or, or um, land registry matters or consumer contracts, which we uh, are going to deal with today. The emphasis also to state the obvious is on contracts which were entered into before we all became aware of the virus. Uh, once the virus impinged on our awareness, then of course we're lumbered with having uh, or having been expected to have taken that into account. So assume that any contracts we are talking about now are contracts which were entered into, let's say to be on the safe side before the 1st of January this year. Now, on the slide, you'll see a whole lot of random factors and these are just in no particular order indications of the way in which the world has changed, the world relevant to the law of contract and performance and enforcement of contracts. A lockdown to take the first one. Um, is it compulsory? It is in some countries, or is it just guidance or advisable? That distinction will in itself give rise to a lot of argument, I suspect, in the future then the nature of the work required in order to perform a contract. It's not only physical in the sense that uh, construction workers and road builders have to use their bodies to do the work, unlike us lawyers, uh, 
but it's also work in connection with the human body, care workers, NHS workers, dentists, people like that. So that suddenly the world has become uh, a very different place, not so much for those of us who can work remotely, as we lawyers are doing at the moment, uh, but for those who can't, for whatever reason. Isolation and quarantine are relevant factors as well, not only of the workers themselves, but of everyone they come into contact or live with. Access to premises. And if you are in a privileged position of being able to get into your work premises, uh, disciplines which apply within those premises, health and safety issues and so on. Travel. Lack of travel, lack of facilities to travel, whether it's permitted at all or not. And if it is permitted at all, whether travel is obviously going to be slower or more infrequent, then there are cost considerations. Is performance of the contract, assuming it's possible at all, going to be substantially more expensive? And who bears the cost of that? Or is it going to be slower? And now we come to the terrible one. All of us, many businesses throughout the world, if they have survived so far, are suffering acutely from reduced turnover, reduced income, reduced poor cash flow. Now, this in itself would have been a sufficiently uh, serious factor to mention today, um, simply because the incentive for various paying parties in particular to reorganize their priorities and if possible, avoid or defer payment was great enough as it is. But uh, on the 20th of May, there was presented in Parliament in this country what has been described by uh, one commentator as a minefield. Um, the word I would have preferred to use is bombshell, but it's a 230 page act uh, dealing with corporate insolvency. Uh, but it um, uh, makes uh, or can, might, might make an enormous difference to uh, what happens to uh, performance and uh, contractual obligations in the near future. We'll come on to that in more detail shortly. Uh, confidence in the future of the economy. A lot of us have uh, concerns about um, how swiftly things will be back to what we used to think was normal. Um, and people are duly cautious about spending money in those circumstances. Insurance is another factor. Uh, business interruption in particular, which has given rise to um, some group litigation. Event cancellation, which we've been involved in as well. You can imagine the number of events worldwide, some of them enormously uh, expensive affairs to arrange and therefore to cancel, has already given rise to a substantial amount of dispute and possibly litigation. And according, I think it was to, to a, com a commentator from Lloyd's in London reported in one of the newspapers recently, the cost in underwriting losses of the pandemic is going to exceed 100 billion US dollars worldwide. Uh, it was uh, compared with the major hurricane years for the insurance industry. I personally would have thought it was um, worse than that, but there you go. If we can just nip on to the next slide, Rufus, so that we have this um, reluctance to pay for good reason or bad. We have concerns and difficulties about performance. And uh, in, in a moment, we will get onto that. Um, I'm not going to dwell on group litigation orders, partly because they are, in a sense, more appropriate for individuals and consumers than for business to business contracts. But in any event, apart from mentioning that there are a couple looming, a couple of um, group litigation cases, in the, there's one in the hospitality industry and another one I'm aware of in the dental sector. I think uh, group cases must be uh, deferred to another time. But I did want to come back just briefly before handing over to this bill, the corporate insolvency bill presented on the 20th of May, all of two days ago. So I hope our attendees will forgive us for not having um, digested 230 pages of the stuff, which isn't a light read in, at the best of times. 
uh, in very broad terms, the purpose of this legislation seems to be to protect businesses that are struggling in the current circumstances and are undergoing rescue. Now, there are some curious uh, phrases or concepts in play here. One of them is that the business is struggling because of the coronavirus. That will probably give rise to argument because it is quite possible that certain businesses would have been struggling anyway. Uh, coronavirus debts is a phrase that is used as well. Again, further argument. Is this debt a coronavirus debt or is it a debt that would have arisen in any event? I suspect um, there will be substantial argument about both these topics. Uh, one of the crucial facets of this uh, bill, and it's only a bill at the moment, but when it's enacted, we are told it will have retrospective effect, is that if a company is covered by the Act and is going through a rescue procedure, suppliers are prevented from withholding supply to that company. So you've got a company that announces it's in need of rescue. For 20 days after that, the supplier must continue to supply, and that 20-day period can be extended for a further 20 days in certain circumstances, and yet further again if the creditors agree or if the court so orders. So this puts suppliers, for example, in what might be a very, very invidious position. The um, Act also imposes, uh, I'm never quite sure whether the, the plural of moratorium is correctly moratoriums or moratoria, both sound awful words to me, um, but it imposes various moratoria on the sort of procedures that um, unpaid suppliers might be tempted to resort to, such as statutory demands and winding up petitions. So we haven't digested that legislation yet. It'll be a merry time when we have to grapple with it. It's too much for today, but everybody should be aware that that is there just when we are least in need of further complications. That's it, I think I've done Thank that. Thank you, James. Well done. Um, we're going to move on in a second. I do just want to point out, um, we don't have a question yet, at least not one posted to the um, webinar system. If you hover somewhere, you should get a belt of choices, one of which will be Q&A. So do please pop your questions as we go, because we would like to hear from you and we would like to be able to make this as interactive as it can be. And there's a question pop up, which I'll have a look at after I've introduced our next speaker. Hattie is going to talk to us about some defences. Over to you, Hattie. We seem to have lost Hattie. I have a frozen Hattie on my screen. I'm assuming that everybody else does as well. Yep, I do. In that case, what I think I will do uh, is let you into the secret that this was not quite as um, uh, unrehearsed as you might have thought, um, and that we did have a quick run through this morning. Uh, so given that I've already admitted that I'm not really a litigator and I don't do this stuff, um, I will tell you what I recall Patty had shared with us this morning. And if she manages to get back on screen before I finish, she can correct me. So our view is that the most likely defences which can be successfully run by reference to the pandemic problem fall into three categories. Um, force majeure, which is uh, where you've got a clause in a contract which actually talks about the fact that um, you may be relieved of certain your obligations if there is a massive intervening act, frequently referred to as an act of God, but certainly something which is heavy enough that it shouldn't have been predicted and thought through. You've got a force majeure clause in the contract, it will turn on the drafting which is actually there. So you're going to need to look at that to work out what kind of defence you can run off the back of your force majeure clause. 
but our view is certainly that if you've got most forms of force majeure clause, then this kind of pandemic, which is unprecedented um, in modern times and has caused a massive change in life, the universe and everything, uh, would be something which triggers it. Uh, another defense you can run is illegality. So if somebody is trying to force you to do something which the regulations have said you must not do, then your principal defense is the law has stopped me from doing this. Now we've seen that being run plenty of times when a new law is introduced and therefore the supply of, let's say, cannabis um, ceases to be legal. Uh, therefore, a contract for the delivery of recreational cannabis would stop being enforceable. And the final defense, which you'll see run frequently, is frustration. What was due to happen cannot happen now because of such a change of events. Again, a seismic change of events. You can't frustrate something just because you say, mm, it's got a bit difficult. Um, this has to be something pretty big and pretty heavy. Um, I hope I've done Hattie's presentation justice. Uh, Seamus, do you want to say a word on that or do you want to move on? I'll, I'll just come in, if I may, with, with a little, uh, some glosses on that. Um, thanks very much for Rufus, you did gallantly. Um, <laughs> I don't like the phrase force majeure myself because I don't speak any French. I get bidets and duvets mixed up and I never know quite how to pronounce it. But equally, I don't like the phrase act of God either because it, um, it, it has uh, religious connotations, which I think are sometimes out of place. But I think we all know what is meant. It is some totally unforeseen event that um, uh, um, justifies in the eyes of the court um, uh, the, uh, the removal of the obligation to perform. Um, illegality is a tricky one because, as I mentioned in the opening um, remarks about lockdown, in some countries uh, lockdown is enforceable as a criminal, uh, with criminal sanctions. In other countries it is merely advisory. I mean, this, this difference is going to give rise to, to substantial argument, I think. Um, the, the next little gloss is that um, one must take into account in connection with all three of these defenses uh, the possibility that your commercial contract is multi-layered so you have a main contractor a subcontractor and a sub subcontractor and they may all be in different countries where different regimes apply um, it's going to be uh, fertile ground i think for for argument uh, the these defenses I can't remember which is which, but at least one of them, and probably more than one, have been described by one senior judge recently as an unruly horse. Um, another judge, not so recently, I think, as treacherous terrain for lawyers. Uh, and the word of warning is that it's very difficult for lawyers to predict um, how courts will uh, view these defenses in the future um, particularly as so many of these contract cases are highly fact specific. Uh, just to give a little example of that point, uh, we tried to see to what extent the Spanish flu, which on any statistical basis was a much greater pandemic than the current one, had on uh, decisions in common law jurisdictions and we could find a little bit of recent research in, in America and in Canada, all of which uh, seemed to show that um, the decisions went both ways. Uh, yes, people relied on the Spanish flu as a, as a reason for not performing or for not paying. Um, and some succeeded and some didn't. So I'm afraid there wasn't much consolation to be drawn from the Spanish flu. I did just want to mention very briefly, sorry to steal Hattie's thunder again, but this, this bill presented to Parliament on the 30th of May. Strictly speaking, I think it would be wrong to say that it creates defences, but it does provide um, uh, reasons for the paying party not to pay, which in the eyes of the, uh, the poor supplier or contractor might be just as good a defence. Rufus, I, I think uh, I... Yeah, no, that's fine. So two things, if I may. First of all, Patty, um, tell us the most interesting point that you were planning on making, because either 
I will have failed to cover it when I impersonated you because you've disappeared with technological challenges. Or alternatively, it will be good enough to be worth underlining. Thank you, Rufus. Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure if it was covered in my absence, uh, but Seamus has, has touched on this already about the, the bill. Uh, meaning companies in financial difficulties will have a moratorium on creditor action. So that will give them at least 20 days to work out a way forward and to present their proposals to creditors. And also action taken by creditors in terms of statutory demands or winding up petitions will be suspended if a court deems inability to pay to be due to the coronavirus. Okay, now that's interesting also because it um, we, we can pick up a question which has been posed on the chat um, and that is what's the sanction if a supplier doesn't supply so assume that this bill becomes an act assume it's got retrospective effect and assume that a supplier who was told um, sorry a, a supplier who was asked to send more bricks to a building site said hang on just a cotton picking moment you're more than 28 days behind on your payment schedule um, I shouldn't do this and the uh, whoever the contracting party who is ordering the bricks is has said ah oh, but you're obliged to supply me because of the whatever it's called bill um, what do we think the sanction is going to be there Shame, yeah. you want to take that one because I think you've kind of got more detail on the bill than I do right thanks Harry um, yeah no, I'll I'll answer that as best I can, bearing in mind that I haven't read all 230 pages of the legislation, if you'll forgive me. My understanding is that in commercial contracts where there is a clause providing that insolvency or similar is a default on which the supplier can rely to cease supplying during the uh, 20 day period, if that's what it is, the supplier is no longer entitled to rely on that clause. There may be other breaches that he can rely on, I'm not sure. But he can't say, uh, you've triggered a the default clause which says that if you're in insolvency or equivalent, um, you're in breach and therefore I needn't supply. But that's about as far as I can take it at this stage, I think. Okay, that question came from Beckenham, but not from me. You can now guess whose it was. Uh, Seamus, we're back with you for extensions of time and for what purpose? Right. Um, the, in no particular order, limitation and prescription. Um, for those of you who are puzzled by a possible distinction between the two, limitation uh, is that phenomenon where the law says, usually by legislation, after a certain period of time, you can no longer bring an action. Uh, prescription, as I understand it, says after a certain period of time, the right ceases to exist. Uh, for all practical purposes, uh, most people regard these as the same thing, but they're called different things in different parts of the world. Uh, we have not found any legislation which alters limitation periods. And for those who um, are interested, and I can't see, by the way, if you're not, it's one of the troubles about a webinar. Uh, there are various limitation periods in English law, ranging from a very short period, three months for certain employment things, mm -hmm. Um, a year for defamation, three years for uh, personal injuries, six years for the general contract and tort ones. Um, and there is a limitation period, I believe, of 100 years for um, conferring the benefits of an advowson or something like that, which I simply don't understand. But I just cite it because somewhere tucked away there, there is a very long limitation period. Now, uh, the word of warning is don't assume that there is any extension of limitation or prescription periods. So if you have a claim to bring, um, don't delay. Standstill agreements are available where parties are approaching, one of them is approaching the end of a limitation period, uh, feels the need to um, either sue very quickly or 
renegotiate the limitation period, which can be done uh, as a matter of contract. So the claimant says to the uh, prospective defendant, um, I'm about to sue you for zillions, but um, my limitation period expires in three days time. Will you give me another six months? Uh, sometimes they're agreed, sometimes they're not. I mean, the, the rationale for a prospective defendant in agreeing to a standstill is that a further few months consideration might indeed cause the claimant to realize that he hasn't got a claim at all or to bring the correct claim rather than a hastily cobbled together claim which uh, drives up expense for everybody to nobody's benefit. So standstill agreements shouldn't be forgotten about. <clears throat> uh, we can find, well, sorry, when this slide was prepared, which was all of three days ago, I would have said that we couldn't find anything that uh, introduced a change in the period during which parties had to perform under their contracts. Of course, the uh, th uh, 20th of May insolvency bill um, does that uh, for the reasons that we've already explained. But that aside, uh, one must adhere, one must assume that the originally agreed contract periods for performance uh, stand and uh, will be upheld. Um, renegotiation is always an, uh, a possibility. Uh, in any circumstances, but um, um, I, I will leave to others the uh, official court time limits and that sort of thing within litigation itself. But um, in most circumstances, uh, both parties or all the parties to a contract, if there are more than one, will be all too well aware of the difficulties caused to them and to their counterparties by this dreaded virus. And one likes to hope that in the circumstances, the scope for sensible uh, renegotiation of time limits for performance uh, uh, should prevail. I'm going to hand over, or Rufus is going to hand over um, to uh, Hannah to deal with um, litigation and procedural time limits, I think. Thank you. That is indeed where we're headed. Um, so we're off to Hannah and um, due to hear about the UK government's advice in relation to access to courts in England uh, and a certain amount of our experience of dealing with <laughs> disputes during this pandemic. Hannah. Thanks Rufus. The general advice from the UK government has changed over the past couple of weeks from stay at home to stay alert, stay alert. But it is still only those who cannot work from home who have actually been encouraged to go back to work, which means that a large majority of the legal sector is still working remotely. Now turning to accessing the courts in England, courts and tribunal service is updating its guidance daily on which courts are doing what because everything is changing on such a fast basis but over half of the courts in England do remain shut completely with staff working only remotely and only a rare few are open where they can follow social distancing guidelines but it's still therefore very much possible to issue a claim and file papers at court but there is much more of a requirement for this to be done online if you are making an application to serve proceedings outside of the jurisdiction, the usual method via the High Court Forum Process section is closed whilst coronavirus is ongoing. This means that parties can still serve outside of the jurisdiction, but provided that they comply with either the service regulation, the Hague Service Convention, or any other treaty which may be applicable to the circumstances but this is often much more complicated and likely to take a lot longer. With regard to hearings, where possible, they are being heard remotely by either telephone or video conferencing of some description, such as Zoom or Skype, or they are being relisted for a later date, although there is no strict guidance yet on what to do if the technology lets you down during a hearing. And if you do have an ongoing matter with the courts currently, the advice is that the relevant court will get in contact with you or your solicitor directly 
to confirm the arrangements of what's going on. Now, looking at procedural time limits for parties who are involved in ongoing litigation, normally, in certain circumstances, parties can agree to extend the time they have to comply with either certain court orders, procedural rules, or practice directions by up to 28 days without having to notify the court and as long as it doesn't jeopardise the hearing date. A new practice direction, 51ZA, has been introduced to help parties by increasing the length of time they can agree to extend to 56 days without having to notify the courts any longer and they would have to notify the courts. For example, this could mean that if a party is say struggling to get and file a witness statement on time or respond to a claim by filing an acknowledgement of service they can agree with the other side to extend the deadline for filing by up to 56 days. This practice direction is actually enforced until the end of October 2020 to help parties during coronavirus and with that in mind I will now hand back over to Seamus who is going to run through emergency orders. Thank you. Seamus. Um, I, I will look at emergency orders in a minute, but if I could just add a couple of things. Thanks very much, Hannah, to, um, uh, to, for that, that uh, canter through that. Um, uh, on the question of serving out of the jurisdiction, of course, one of the problems is not just whatever difficulties we're encountering within this jurisdiction, but by virtue of the fact that another jurisdiction invo is involved, you might well have to um, cater for uh, and be alert to the possibility of, of further problems in that second jurisdiction. And I'm thinking in particular here of South Africa because South Africa has recently moved from level five lockdown to level four lockdown. Um, in South Africa, originating process has to be served by the sheriff, which is a, a state officer. Um, but in level four lockdown, the sheriff is not operating. So you could uh, suddenly find that you got an order for service out of the jurisdiction in South Africa, but were neutralized mm -hmm. uh, by inability to serve in South Africa until the um, uh, level four is downgraded to level three. Uh, we get, or I get the impression, and I don't think anybody's disabused me of this recently, that during our lockdown in, period in, in Britain, there was an initial phase of about a month or six weeks during which the court officials and the judiciary themselves, and I hope I'm not defaming any particular judge here, were, um, shall we say, resistant to um, enthusiastic embracing of technology. Uh, that attitude seems to have changed over the last month or so. And uh, as with all of us who've had to learn very quickly how to deal with things like Zoom, when we never thought months ago that we'd ever have to, um, it, things are improving enormously in terms of access to the courts, as uh, Hannah um, mentioned. Uh, somebody raised earlier the question of uh, being let down with the technology, of course there's a risk that the technology will let us down, as indeed it did today in this very webinar. Um, but electronic and technological letdowns uh, will just be a different form of failing. In the old days, before technology, matters went awry for all sorts of reasons, strikes, transport difficulties, snow, gales, all sorts of things. So uh, there, there, there will be swings and roundabouts. If we use technology, the transport strikes and the being snowbound at home may no longer be a problem. Uh, but there always were risks uh, connected with the, the system before. And finally, just one point I should have um, mentioned earlier. I didn't mention protocol letters, but in this country we have a system uh, that requires you to write what's called a protocol letter before you initiate a claim, um, setting out uh, in a fair amount of detail the, uh, the claim that you have to make or that you intend to make and providing documents, the essential documents in support of it, 
um, and the, uh, the recipient of that claim is given three weeks to acknowledge and generally, depending on the protocol, three months to respond. And uh, those time limits have not changed as far as we are aware, they still exist. Now, um, I, I was um, asked to deal with emergency orders here and I think I can deal with these quite briefly because even throughout the lockdown period, our courts have been open and available for emergency procedures. And as far as I am aware, um, no party who uh, genuinely requires an emergency order has um, been frustrated in that respect. One of the benefits of our system is, and I'm, a, I'm an immigrant a long time ago, but nevertheless an immigrant from another jurisdiction, one of the benefits of the, the system we have in this country for civil litigation is the degree of trust and confidence that judges uh, repose in counsel and solicitors and counsel's clerks um, when they are told that a matter is truly urgent. Um, and we ourselves have had experience of this um, in various cases. Years ago, I had a case in, in which a two week trial period was given for the original trial. And during that trial, there were two occasions on which we had to go to the Court of Appeal within the two, two week trial period successfully. Um, and the system can work very fast when it is required to do so. On emergency orders, I don't foresee much in the way of problems for commercial parties in getting the emergency orders. With commercial work, we are talking primarily, I think, about um, asset freezing, asset tracing orders, and uh, search and seizure orders, what used to be known more romantically as Mareva injunctions and Anton Pillar orders. Uh, the difficulty is not so much going to be in getting them, but I do foresee uh, difficulties in serving them and enforcing them. Uh, there always were difficulties about serving and enforcing those two, as they are called, nuclear weapons of the civil litigation industry. But they are difficulties which very frequently the applicant, usually the claimant, uh, was aware of in advance and alerted the court to, and people were able to work around them. Uh, for example, uh, a, C a search order does not permit the claimant or the applicant to break the door down and go in if there's nobody in the premises. It is an order addressed to someone saying, um, you've got to let us in. Now, if that person is on the premises, well and good. If that person is not, there may be a problem. So I suspect parties are going to have to find that person somewhere else and perhaps even tailor the order to say, if you're not at the premises yourself, for whatever reason, um, you're going to have to open up to allow the claimant stroke applicant in. So there, there will be difficulties about uh, enforcement. I don't see, somebody asked about uh, supervising solicitors. In this country, we have a requirement that a seizure, search and seizure order has to be uh, supervised by an independent solicitor. Uh, I don't see any difficulty in uh, rustling up the independent solicitor to do the job, but he or she will, like the applicant or claimant, be faced with similar difficulties, particularly when it comes to taking possession of documents or physical items um, or of gaining access to electronic data. I think I've done my bit on emergency. I would agree with that. Just before we move off this slide, um, I have an appalling joke to make, which is that um, when I saw PD51ZA, I did wonder if it was a postcode, but I have just looked up and there isn't a postcode for PD, so I think that we can assume that PD51ZA will not be confused with a physical address. Um, oh gosh, Seamus, it's going to be you again. Well, it is, Rufus. I'm going to... Um tease you about being parochial and local. I bet you only looked up the UK for that postcode. Right, sir. 
this has an international element, this webinar. Right. Um, the purposes of this slide is really just to raise, uh, for the benefit of, of the attenders, uh, possibilities if litigation looks like being too slow or impossible. Uh, the, the first, of course, is if by any chance the relations between the two contracting parties lend themselves to the possibility of uh, courts in different jurisdictions entertaining any dispute between them, that could be looked at. It might be particularly significant if there are different limitation periods in different jurisdictions, as there frequently are. Uh, doing nothing is always an option. It's usually the cheapest option. It's frequently the best option, and it always deserves to be considered among a range of options, even if it's only to be considered in order to be rejected at an early stage. Uh, renegotiating contract terms, of course, um, I'm, I'm repeating myself here to a certain extent. I think in, this, in, the, in the current climate, parties will be uh, more amenable than one would have predicted a year or, or so ago to renegotiating terms to cater for the current circumstances. Standstill agreements we've dealt with. Um, arbitration is a possibility. It is not uh, a requirement for arbitration that there was an original substantive commercial contract with an arbitration clause in it. Um, because if there was, then the party is would in any way uh, rather than the litigation. But it is always open to parties after a dispute has arisen to decide that instead of troubling the court with their dispute for a decision, they will um, embark on arbitration even after the dispute has arisen. Uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a step that is taken in certain jurisdictions where either uh, the court process is terribly slow and the parties want a decision quickly. They don't always both want a decision quickly, of course, but where they sometimes do. Um, and sometimes in jurisdictions where the commercial parties involved do not have enormous faith in the quality of the judicial process. So arbitration is a, is a, is a, is something to be considered. Mediation, of course, um, in English litigation, mediation is almost certainly going to be <clears throat> more or less insisted on by the courts as a, a step in the process. Uh, some mediations succeed for surprising reasons. Some mediations fail for surprising reasons. Uh, mediations are not without cost. But my view is that uh, the cost of a mediation compared with the cost of not settling at that stage and continuing with the litigation is so modest that it's a no-brainer. The parties almost always should, so should almost always uh, indulge in a mediation, even if that mediation has to be conducted in a manner that would have been regarded a year ago as less than satisfactory, i.e by um, Skype or video call or telephone. Um, I've put expert determination there in brackets because um, Rufus and I will fall to blows about this. Um, it's usually listed amongst the uh, range of dispute resolution uh, alternatives to litigation. Uh, Rufus will say it is a, a, a form of dispute resolution. I say, Strictly speaking, it isn't. It's a deferred, it's a mechanism for the determination of a term of the contract which is to be deferred. The problem is, and where the two, where the two theories collide, is that by the time that determination comes to be made, the parties uh, are already adopting uh, conflicting positions, and so it takes on a lot of the mantle or the appearance of a dispute resolution mechanism. Early neutral evaluation <clears throat> is not terribly popular in this country, I believe, more popular across the pond, uh, but it is also uh, intended to be a cheap, um, I'm not sure cheerful is the right word, but a cheap and effective uh, commercial uh, way of resolving uh, problems. And then, of course, there are 
as always, settlement negotiations. That those, I think, should all be borne in mind if you're faced with the prospect of difficult litigation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Q&A, we do have a couple of questions. I don't know whether my fellow panelists want to ping them out and, and work out if they want to jump in and try to answer one of them. Um, but as our icebreaker, quite frequently in previous um, webinars, I confess that I've made up an icebreaker and I've said, um, this is what we're gonna discuss uh, during it because I thought that, that was a nice way to kick things off. This time, uh, it's a genuine icebreaker which came in because, as you may recall, we asked before preparing this webinar, what are people interested in? So here was one from one of our esteemed contacts. In your experience, are arbitrators or other tribunals willing to run hearings with Zoom or similar, given that this introduces new skills, namely the ability to manage the formal process by this method? So who wants to share some experience on that topic? Um, I'll have to say that we have seen that the Court of Appeal is using Skype for Business and the BT equivalent to do hearings when they've got 25 to 40 plus um, attendees with them. So they are trying to get to grips with the technology and use it as much as possible. Thank you. I think we'd also remind people that Seamus made a very valid point that um, of course, we see technology breakdown, even managed to kick poor Hattie off the um, webinar at her moment of glory today. But it's not as if non-technological things don't create issues. People get ill and can't make it to hearings. People are stuck in traffic and don't make it to a critical meeting where they're supposed to sign a document, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the, the challenges are to rise to what is chucked at you and to make sure that um, client need is as best as possible coped with. Um, I'm gonna to pop to another question. Um, I'll read it out and I think I'm gonna bowl it Hattie's way. So my in-laws have a 60th wedding anniversary event booked for March, the 20th, uh, March 2021. Deposit paid and there's a further sum due. There's a force measure, a clause in the contract which says that they can cancel, uh, sorry, that the, can, the event can be canceled um, if outside reasonable control, you simply can't make the venue available for the event on the event date. So we don't know what government regs will be at the time, but we do know that at the moment, um, if this were going to happen, it would be uh, impossible and cancelled, etc. So what would our advice be to them? Should they cough the next payment because if they can't hold the event, they'll get it back? Or should they be saying now, we don't want to pay anything more because we can't be sure whether this event can happen or not? So I would suggest that you, you do still make the payment just because otherwise you, you may be in breach of contract yourself. Um, in terms of the, the clause in the contract that says that you may cancel the event if it's outside of your reasonable control, obviously I think that we'd probably have to have a look at that clause, but from the sounds of it, it, it sounds as though you may be in a position uh, to get a refund if the event can't go ahead due to the coronavirus restrictions. Thanks and well done. Um, another question, a different light, but um, interesting in itself. How can a party to litigation best deal with the opponent who will use the paralysis and shut, slow down in court activity to push out their case and delay the steps they need to take to their apparent advantage? We do know that in any bit of litigation, there tends to be one party who'd like a solution tomorrow, and one party who'd quite like this to go on um, until um, the next millennium. Seamus, one for you. Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy to take this, um, because it's a perennial problem in litigation, especially, uh, especially for claimants. Um, all, all people embarking, all parties embarking on, on litigation should assume, there are exceptions, but should assume that the other side is going to do uh, everything possible to make it as slow and as expensive as, as possible. And the skill of the litigators um, 
is demonstrated by their ability to foresee that sort of behavior and to and to work around it and if i'm permitted i i i will just mention uh, an occasion on which i was um involved in some passing off litigation against uh, 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 two individuals, one of whom was a professional defendant. And for those who don't know the phrase, we use it in the, in the legal industry to describe people who probably know the rules better than we do, even though they're not lawyers and, and are very good at uh, um, avoiding the consequences of what we regard as their nefarious actions. And um, this defendant uh, achieved postponement after postponement after postponement for all sorts of reasons which we regarded um, as specious. But we thought we'd finally nailed him when we fixed a summary judgment hearing for a certain day in, um, I think it was October 1987. And this bloke managed to rustle up a hurricane. I don't know how he did it, but the hurricane put paid to our hearing, so the litigation took another six months. It's a perennial problem. I'm sorry, this, that's not much of an answer. But, uh, and we must bear in mind in this webinar that some of those uh, who are listening may one day be in the position of, um, of claimants, but others who are listening may be in the position of defendants. So I'm trying to be even-handed about this. We must predict that the, the defenses that defenses that Hattie and Rufus dealt with uh, and the general uh, unpredictability of the outcome of those defenses will enable defendants uh, to um, make things more expensive and probably to take longer. I'm sorry about that. I don't like it, but that's that's the position, I'm afraid. Well, well done, Hannah, Hattie, Seamus, um, for contributing so well to this webinar. We've got no further open questions. Um, we've got nothing else on the chat at the moment. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up. We've done about 50 minutes. That's what we tend to aim for, somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes, including some time for questions. I'm pleased we did get some questions and that we could cope with them. Um, again, thank you to my fellow panelists. Thank you to all of you who joined, we managed to keep an amazingly high attendance rate. Um, my brother-in-law commented that um, he's in further education and it's all very well putting things online, but how do you deal with the student who logs on to prove that they're attending but mutes it so that they can get on with other things? Um, so if you have muted the whole thing, don't worry, it'll be on YouTube for you to put up with later. Um, if you've actually listened to it and cooperated through it, then thank you very much. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and let's keep trying to get legal work done as best we possibly can. Bye. Bye-bye.